welcome back to the Novelty Podcast. My name is Alexandra. And I'm Emily. And this is the podcast where we talk about books and drink tea. So what are we drinking today, Emily? Today we are drinking Harney and Son's Hot Cinnamon Spice. Just in time for fall, everybody. It's felt like it was a very appropriate episode to do something spicy for. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Oh, that is good with honey. <laughs> oh, that's delicious. A little cloves. A little clove, a little cinnamon spice. Yeah, it's good stuff. Yeah. Um, and so I typically read kind of from the pre- perspective that you would have in a typical English class of literary analysis. I like to think about what the reader owes the book. And I read more from the perspective of writing and editing, so I like to think about what the writer owes the reader. And today we're going to be talking about the sort of two early classic vampire books. We have Cl- uh, Carmilla by um, Sheridan La Fanu. Le- Le Fanu? I'm going to go with that. (laughs) Yeah. And then, of course, Dracula by Bram Stoker. So we're very excited about this. This has been a fun little adventure because we've kind of read them around the same time. Yeah. I actually read read Carmilla because you recommended it. And I think you had read Dracula before I had. And then I was talking to you about it when I was was reading it. (laughs) Yeah. You showed up one day and you're like, I'm in the middle of Dracula. And I was like, have you made it to the terrier scene yet? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Dracula is so fun as a book. It okay. Is. Well, before we get into that, we should maybe let's lay some groundwork for the vampire genre and what we think it's doing in literature. Which is like such a huge and enduring. I mean, I've read that um, vampire like legends go back as far as Egypt, right. and most cultures have a version of a vampire legend. Right. There's just something very deep that vampires <laughs> speak to us and right. i mean obviously there are vampire movies that are being released this year they are not going away right so well what do you feel like the purpose of kind of the horror genre is and how like vampires fit into that i mean the horror genre i feel like is a lot of ways like the humor genre where it's like making us look at things mm-hmm. um and horror is so useful for that especially in terms of like immortality stories they they make us look at the thing that we're probably most afraid of which is dying yeah um and vampires speak to that so much because you know they're characters who in essence can do what people think they would want to do Mm -hmm. live forever but there is obviously a lot of costs for that right so that's i think a huge aspect of it but then there's also the whole aspect that i think you cannot ignore with vampires is that their sexuality and what they represent on so many different layers with Mm -hmm. that Yeah, and I think, you know, even the idea of sexuality being tied in with sort of immortal youth or immortal life. The cult of beauty. Exactly, and that being sort of intrinsically linked, but then the horror of being like, oh, I'm, you know, maybe attracted to something that's a thousand years old, or this thing that is a thousand years old has, you know, this zest of life and this capability still as like a young person would. Mm -hmm. There's something truly horrific about that yeah yeah you're dealing with your sense of attraction and like why am i attracted to this you Mm -hmm. know while at the same time like vampires are always portrayed at least in western literature as like the ideal human form Mm -hmm. that's usually what people are are attracted to and that is like physically speaking they're the ideal humans Mm -hmm. and so then you get like an extra terrifying like element of like you know the yeah. things that are so beautiful are often things hiding danger. Yeah. And I think then it's no wonder that stories like Dracula and Carmilla are engaging with our understanding of sexual mores and what's transgressive within our sexual culture. Both of these are Victorian novels written in the mid to late 1800s. There's nothing more the Victorians like to talk about. Let's <laughs> yeah, be honest. Yeah, it's their own paranoia <laughs> about sex. Yeah. And so we have in Carmilla um, a, a homosexual relationship between two ladies. And obviously in Dracula, we're examining female desire and what that looks like. Right. Like... Uh oh, the ladies do in fact have desire. That's what? <laughs> what? They like someone other than the average English gentleman? Uh oh. <laughs> Could be a problem. Um, and so I think it just makes a, less, a lot of sense that within that genre, we're kind of working out our feelings about what might be transgressive sexually within a given culture and we see that even up through the modern era with something like interview with a vampire which is also dealing with questions of homosexuality and things like that and the the vampire characters became a really great vessel for talking about it right it's the i feel like more than any other horror character vampires are a vessel for like interviewing ourselves and Mm -hmm. investigating ourselves like there's not really i feel like this is why there is a definitive vampire novel like i don't I couldn't really say what the definitive lycanthrope novel is because right. I don't think that that, that character, while 
you know, werewolves and zombies and, you know, mummies and all that can be, like, fun stories. I've never read any of those stories that, like, like hit to the heart of, like, something about humanity in the way that vampires do on, like, a lot of different... You can pick and choose what you want your vampire to make you afraid of because they have a, a facet of things about humanity that makes them... Mm-hmm. interesting when it was like you're saying like they are one of the few monsters that still has like a deep connection to their own humanity they mm-hmm. don't lose their humanity when they become or they're like memories of being human when they become right. you know the monster version of themselves right so they are more it just intrinsically connected to their past yeah they remember who they were exactly and that and even if you're doing like a werewolf or whatever where it's like yeah it transforms into this large wolf well you have the, the sense that they're they're not conscious of their humanity or right. their identity, which is not the case. Or zombies, obviously, Frankenstein monster, a mummy, all of those that you listed off. None of them have a connection to a human selfhood, right? You know. Well, and also in a lot of vampire stories, it centers around the concept of people choosing to be vampires. Whereas, mm-hmm. like most other monster stories, are like this just happens, you know, yeah. and oh beer. Yeah. But like, there's a lot of angst and drama and many stories about vampires of people like choosing this because mm-hmm. they don't want to die or yeah. they you know want to be a part of this like kingdom that this kind of some authors you know build around it mm-hmm. you know or for all various different reasons like this is like a horrifying choice you, that they make you can make a pros and cons list about being a vampire you can't really make a pros and cons list about being a zombie <laughs> <laughs> There might be, you know, it's exploring what would it take in a human, in a human's life, which we know our own lives are riddled with suffering and tragedy. You know, what would it look like for that person to want to escape to it in a, in a, in a way to a new type of existence. Right. And I feel like also like, interestingly, like vampires also have like a different, a deep, deeper connection to like a religious Mm-hmm. concepts more than any other monster because I mean if you've been just talking about like interviews with the vampire like that is like a very long examination of the concept of someone like choosing to be damned and you can have that conversation in vampires you can't really have that conversation with I got bit by a werewolf you right. know yeah. it's it, there's so many more complex areas you can go to with vampires yeah which is why we're still going there absolutely and that's what we're talking about today so um, for those who might not be familiar with Carmilla, what is sort of like the rough summary of the book? No spoilers, but just to leave the rough summary. Book. So Carmilla was published about like 25 years before Dracula, um, and it is the story of a young English girl, about 19 years old, who's living in Romania. I'm not going to try to like pronounce the name of it. Yeah, yeah. Stria, Stria, something like that. Something like that, with her widowed father who's like, an English like ambassador type yeah. situation and is very lonely you mm-hmm. know we're out in like kind of the Romanian woods and they're in this classic castle type situation right. right and then she's like this is like this era of fiction was like so anti-subtle so it's like how are we gonna set up the motivations for this character I don't know let's have her have a conversation with her dad where she's like whoa I don't have any friends I wish I had some friends <laughs> then along comes a carriage <laughs> then along comes a carriage yeah, with a young lady in it <laughs> She's like, oh, companion. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and mysteriously, the, the woman in there is like, I must leave my daughter with you. Would you care for her for me? <laughs> right. Don't ask her questions about who she is or where we come from. <laughs> <laughs> Magical best friend arrives. <laughs> exactly. And so we have the building of the character of a uh, Car- relationship between Carmilla and Laura. Laura is narrating the whole thing. It's like, is it her journals or her? Yeah, I feel like it is an epistolary novel. It is an epistolary, well. but it's just all her. It's not yeah. Dracula is like a lot of different people and yeah. you know methods. I think it's just her journals. I agree. It's been a while since we've read it. Yeah. So it's all her perspective. Everything is you know from her her yeah. viewpoint, which is like. One of the issues I do have with it because it's it's way too narrow of yeah. a, a viewpoint, but it still succeeds in a lot of the you know the mm-hmm. horror that you need to come out of these novels mm-hmm. because something mysterious is visiting Laura at night and she's you know trying to convince herself it's all just a dream. Oh no, what yeah. could it be? So <laughs> so you know you have this sort of structure. It's very much like you know, the archetype of the Garden of Eden. You have God the Father, you have the child here in this innocent and idyllic situation that's, you know, untouched and she hasn't faced any troubles in her life yet, except for that she's lonely, just like Adam in the Garden of Eden. Right, right. Right, and so then it's like, oh, we bring in this companion. And in this case, she's obviously playing the role of like the serpent the serpent sort of comes in and is a source of temptation and is a gives her what she needs right. gives her what she's looking for she's you know a devoted companion mm-hmm. the yeah. kind of companion everybody would want someone yeah. who just truly all they want is to be with you right and and then of 
you know, and that's sort of like the framework of the story. But within that story, we are dealing with questions of like how uncomfortable and uncanny it is to have a relationship with someone that maybe there's something not quite right. This right. person that you trust and that you love and that you feel connected to and very close with, but they're actually doing you harm. And right. everything that they're sort of suggesting about how to lock the door or how to protect yourself, it's like they know that it's doing nothing to keep this evil yeah. force out or away from you. I think there's even a moment where Lauren describes like that she's both very attracted to Carmilla and very yeah. repulsed by her in mm-hmm. the same response. And she doesn't know how to like in essence yeah. she's just almost kind of like paralyzed in this yeah. that she doesn't know what to do with these feelings and these emotions but then also something's going on yeah <laughs> yeah and so in the midst of her friendship she has what is very clearly like a homosexual attraction and there's like very clearly a romantic and sexual component to their relationship right right carmilla well and like Unlike um, other vampire novels, Carmilla's victims are all female. Mm-hmm. You know, we're not having the traditional, like, male-female mm-hmm. that we see in other ones. Although, I mean, Carmilla is one of the earliest, so mm-hmm. I shouldn't say unlike the others. Like, Carmilla is more it's like the of... others are unlike Carmilla. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like, all of her victims are female. Like, the village nearby is, like, slowly losing all of its young women. Yeah. You know, so she's obviously only attracted to female victims Mm -hmm. or companionships like there's I think described like that she gets very close to you know a number of her victims before she takes them Mm -hmm. and she's not killing Laura she's just like slowly taking her Her, taking her blood and taking her attention and taking her focus and taking her the and if we think of like our attention as what our life is where you focus it and what who you get enthralled with or enraptured with that becomes your life and so in a way, it's like, one, she's taking her life force literally as, as vampires do by sucking the blood, but she also takes her sort of attention and um, energy. It all her becomes, life just becomes focused on her. Yeah, her, her life just becomes Carmilla. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so that's Carmilla. And then on the other end of the spectrum, we have Dracula. Which is just... Dracula's extra. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> also, you might say unsubtle. <laughs> I was actually... One of the things I was reading about was like... Dracula is like Carmilla in this way, but more. Dracula is like Carmilla in this way, but more. And I'm like, that is that is just Dracula. It's yeah. extra in all the ways, but in the right ways. Like, yeah. it just makes it into a very fun novel. So, you know, for instance, like, whereas Carmilla all takes place in this one castle, and you've got mentionings of things happening outside, really the whole action point takes place in this one yeah. place, which is kind of traditional horror mm-hmm. in and of itself. Dracula is very sweeping. You know, you're in Transylvania one minute, yeah. you're in England the next minute, you're running through the forests of Romania. And, you know, it's like, yeah. it's a much more adventure type novel. Yeah, it borrows a lot of tropes from a lot of travel writing that was being right. published at the time. So even, you know, as many of you may be more familiar, Harker is traveling at the beginning and it's dealing with these tropes of what it's like to experience a foreign culture. And right. they're interesting in this way. And, you know, a lot Strange of... Strange in that <laughs> way. Yeah. And a lot of like, oh, what a simple peasant, you know, and that kind of thing. And and his early diaries, which we should say Dracula is also epistolary, but as you were hinting before, there's also newspaper articles and someone else's, yeah, and someone else's, um, you know, various records or Mina's um, report of what her experiences were and all, all of these different things. So, yeah, it's a little more diverse, which I think helps actually heighten Oh, yeah. the tension because you're seeing it from all different people's perspectives and some people are in denial and some people are terrified and so that mm-hmm. I think adds to the a little bit more sense of like action and, and yeah. to a certain extent horror too because you know from when you only have Laura's perspective and Laura's trying to talk herself out of stuff that sometimes kind of like kills the moment yeah because you're but, like come on girl don't be dumb yeah, let's not like your narrator has to be dumb in order to like allow the action to proceed don't go back into the haunted house, you dangus. You know, it's like you kind of have that situation. Um, and for her to maintain, it's, it's like it, pu- it puts the author in a real bind. Right, exactly. Whereas I think Dracula is much freer to just kind of build on like... Pop different perspectives. Yeah. This person's very serious about it. And once everybody understands this person's like, now we're fine. We're fine. It's fine. <laughs> I think one of my favorite moments was when there was like one news article where it was like, the local zoo lost all of its wolves. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> or something like that. Yeah. It, there are definitely moments in which you know, Dracula's epistolary format falls apart and it's not really epistolary. But there are moments like that where it's like, this is using it to its best effect. (laughs) And I I always find 
you know, I, I complained in our last podcast episode about it with the, the novel of Pamela. And there's a moment with Harker that's very similar where he gets trapped in the catacombs. You know, and it's like, oh, I got to pull out my diary and write about it. As we're in the catacombs. <laughs> right. I'm not going to sit here and find a way to get out. Oh, no, there's really attractive vampire ladies down there. <laughs> but don't, but don't, but don't, but don't. <laughs> Writing about it furiously. <laughs> like, now's not the time. You don't need your journal at this moment. There are other... Other things going on, Harker. <laughs> no, no, I must ma- remain pure. <laughs> <laughs> and write about it. <laughs> <Yeah>. Seriously. <laughs> I'm fine. I'm not, a- not attracted to these mostly naked vampire ladies. <laughs> I'm just interested in what's happening. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny. And I think that's also one of the things that makes Dracula really, really fun to read as a modern reader is like, you can see how it's would have been effective in its own time as a horror novel. Right. But it's not, for the modern reader, very scary anymore. It's no. kind of just comedic. I mean, there are, like, excellent examples of, like, intense, like, building the, the sense of tension and stuff like that. But, like, some of the things are just, like, I was just straight up laughing. I mean, it's... That's not to, like, diminish it in any way, because it's just such a thoroughly enjoyable right. read. But there are moments where you're just like, that is so entertaining and I don't think that that's what that was meant to be (laughs) yeah so obviously we have Harker in Transylvania seeing Dracula as he's sort of like old and wizened and one of the things that I think is really interesting is that Harker encounters a Dracula who's very interested in English culture he has maps he's reading books he's asking Harker about English culture he's brought an Englishman to him yeah and he's Harker is surprised by how well educated Dracula is about British society. Right. Because Harker, by contrast, is like, look at these little... (laughs) What is this world I'm in? (laughs) And he has, you know, read about it and has some, like, you know, language barrier issues and things like that. But, like, Dracula is a much better student of the culture that he's kind of trying to, you know, invade, if you will. (laughs) But, yeah, that's the... It's not really a a point of interest in um, Carmilla what Camilla's background is and you know like Mm -hmm. we we do eventually find out like where she comes from but it's not really that important it's more just like fun fact you know whereas that's very important in Dracula right that Dracula is from Romania and he wants to come to England Transylvania Sorry. Well, Transylvania is... Is it in Romania? Yeah, yeah. It's Romania. Okay, that's my ignorance. Wallachia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think, you know, by contrast for Carmilla, the fact that is she like a duchess, but she's from the aristocracy. See, yes. Like yeah. from this ancient family. That's much more of interest, and it seems to be critiquing the sort of effete aristocracy and the, that there's like this perhaps a corruption that comes from within a society yeah, if, right. your, if your aristocracy becomes too weak or too interested in indulgence. Whereas Dracula is much more interested in like the threat of an external force, this foreigner coming into England. Which, we, so Dracula is hinted at, like, which is a great, I think a great fiction trope where you're not just being like, hey, Dracula was this guy from like, you know, the Ottoman Empire era. Instead, he's just like, maybe he's this guy yeah. from the but who we think he is is in essence like this warlord yeah. who's known for mass murdering his enemies and taking over countries and stuff like that so you can see from the beginning like you know Carmela is is being related to just a you know a duchess but you know there's no outside other than that like oh she's yeah. from the other side whereas Dracula is like oh he's probably this gigantic warlord who's basically been committing genocide since like the 7th century yeah. you know or something like that <laughs> which of course adds to the horror of like Okay, if we were to take, you know, what would be the equivalent? Maybe, like, a the most famous, like, serial murderer or something like that? And then be like, what if he lived forever? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's scary. <laughs> yeah, I think that's one of the best, like, foundational points of Dracula. Um, and actually excellent writing to be like, maybe that's who it is. <laughs> Go and look who that is. That's scary. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, after we get through the... Th- the phase where Harker is in Transylvania. Then we have Dracula transports himself to, to England. England. Yeah. And we have adventures in England. Various adventures in England. 
various adventures in England that usually involve young ladies. Yes. And the potential threat to you. And we have like the classic Victorian woman, yeah. which Laura in Carmela is also the right. classic Victorian woman. They represent everything that Victorian women are. They like are staying in their father's house. You know, they're obviously virgins. You know, they're waiting for, you know, the young man. Um, Lucy becomes like the first primary interest of Dracula. And she, I always like love this concept in, in English fiction because this is the thing. Like all the guys in the neighborhood have proposed to her. All of them want to marry her. And she's just having a time trying to pick which one she's actually going to marry. Right. Which kind of like don't. Don't you have feelings? I don't know. <laughs> you know, so she's picked one, but all the men, even though they've been rejected by her, are still devoted to her right. and they're all still friends. So it's very, it's a very Victorian story just from its start. But of yeah. course, Lucy is Dracula's first victim. Yeah. And, and Dracula, like, story is, it's very heterosexual. He really, really wants the hot young ladies. <laughs> yes. And, you know, underneath the surface, what Dracula is sort of, like, exposing in terms of its transgressive sexuality is, uh-oh, maybe the young ladies might want him, too. Well, because by the time... So when we meet him in Transylvania, he's an older man, you know, and a little more wizened. But because he's been feeding all the way to England, <laughs> by the time he gets there, he's a nice romantic figure. Yes. He's, He's he, tall, dark, and handsome. He is attractive to the ladies. <laughs> yeah. And we don't really like to maybe address the fact that women, in fact, do have desire of their own. They might be interested in the foreigner. Yeah. Uh-oh. <laughs> That's not allowed. No. And so uh, Lucy succumbs. She, uh, as you said, is the first victim. And this sort of rallies all of the men together. To, right. Like, we have, we have this, to hunt the Dracula. We now. basically have like a fiancé army after that. <laughs> right. <laughs> And in fact, her like main fiance, they like set a trap because so, then it's like, oh no, now Lucy is taking victims. And it's interesting because her victims are children. Right. That's true. And so it sort of sets up this trope of her unfulfilled motherhood is that she now, what she desires or what the next step for her would be in life right. would be this desire for motherhood. And so anyway, so she has all these children victims, the neighborhood's all upset, the guys go out, we got to go hunt her. And like the actual fiance like sees her and he's like you know, enthralled by her, and they're like, no, <laughs> holding him back, you can't go, she's a monster, you know, okay, sorry for yelling, <laughs> and it's just so hilarious, like, no, don't go in, you know, and then he's like, heartbroken, she's not who she used to be, oh no, she's Is not she's pure anymore, dead, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and she even comes out like, ba -dum -ba -dum, and get, like, part two of, like, Harker in the castle, but just, like, Lucy in the, I don't know, it's like, in a graveyard graveyard yeah yeah with her fiance and it's 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 just so melodramatic it's so great <laughs> well and i love that that's also the point of it like where we start getting in um the van helsing character mm -hmm. who's also a foreigner right but he kind of comes in into this like weird place where the foreigner comes in and is the level-headed one yeah you know and because that's just not an english thing whereas like all of these young men are just like beside themselves for like losing lucy but then also lucy is a monster and what are we going to do if van helsing's like we're going to cut her head off that's what we're going to do yeah it's just that easy yeah <laughs> let me show you how a vampire hunter yeah. does it yeah you want to stick some garlic and he has like <laughs> all of this sort of like um you know obscure sort of peasant lore that he's collected over time so it makes right him... he's like a doctor of vampires yeah and he's like and he sits in this sort of liminal space between like good englishness the, the and then also like right in between like now we're getting into i don't know those foreigners are scary and weird and we don't <laughs> like them maybe yeah. they suck blood we don't know <laughs> but, but probably yeah you know, i don't know and what happens when the foreigner tries to invade us like we've been invading other people this entire time uh oh let's not think about that. Yeah, that, might, that might pull up some fears and maybe a little bit of guilt. <laughs> <laughs> Just a smidgen. No, no, no. It's fine. We don't, we don't Every, want to think about that. Shh. Everything is fine. Just put up some more crosses. Yeah. It'll be better. Yeah. <laughs> so Van Helsing comes in, and then in the midst of this, Mina, who's the other female character, the best friend of Lucy, uh, starts showing signs that she might be the next victim. Right. And, yeah. and we have now we have Jonathan, her husband, added to the army of men trying to protect their women. Right. Yeah. It's it's such a it's such an interesting comparison to Carmilla because Carmilla is obviously a huge influence on Dracula. I mean, 
But I don't think Brian Sober hid that at all. He he liked Carmilla. Yeah. Um, and that's there's many ways in where you're just like, oh, that's the the influence on there. But I I have often heard like the description, the difference between like the way men and women write is that women tend to focus on like home and community, whereas men tend to focus on like the world and conquering the world. And that is exactly the separation between Carmilla and Dracula. Yes, one hundred percent. The Dracula is so expressing. British fears and guilt around their own colonialism right. and fears around what would it look like if they were colonized the way that they have been colonizing the world. Right. Whereas Carmilla is more about like the breakdown of a family. Right. You know, the loss of an individual. Yeah. You know, the individuals are so like, you know, the, the, uh, Carmela's first victim yeah. is another young woman and then you have Laura and like just like the cherishing of this one individual and like our peace has been broken our idyllic little world has been broken and the world at large doesn't really matter right you know that's the the home is what matters and our home has been destroyed 100% so then we go into the mode of hunting Dracula which has one of our favorite scenes. Oh my god. Not intended to be comedic, Not but probably comedic. one of the funniest scenes I've ever read in a book. Yeah. So Dracula, because it's Dracula, like he's you know being faced with this army of fiancés and of course releases his rats because he's just, he's got an army of rats. The Englishmen are not faced by this at all because... <laughs> They have terriers. Yes. In the, in the midst of them like being like, oh, we're going to go hunt Dracula at one of the homes that he has. So we've now gone into this house. They've come prepared, you know, with guns and pistols and whatever else. Nice. They're ready. They're ready to have a showdown. The rats appear. And apropos of nothing, nothing. bros are just pulling dogs oh, out of their pockets. They're like, just I, like, no big. I got... It's like, I, I cannot picture this scene without seeing a guy wearing a holster on each side. And he's got a terrier in each hip. And he just pulls one out, cocks it, and releases it. <laughs> right. Because they're so just like, no big deal. We got terriers. Like, this we're is English. Not, this has not been introduced or seeded no. at any point. No. This is a deus ex machina moment <laughs> of, like, the highest proportions. And then one of them's like, and I've got my husband hunting whistle yeah and, of course, and these terriers just kick ass like they yeah. just they just mow through those rats yeah. and dracula's like darn i didn't they defeated my rats I didn't think of the terriers <laughs> <laughs> the british have been breeding like 50 different breeds of this for eons <laughs> let's also not forget these are supernatural rats but still yeah. not a match for the english terrier <laughs> it's so i good. i love this novel from the mo I, 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 I read this novel first time, absolutely loved it, but that moment, because I come from a very, very Anglo family, and that the, the Angloness of that moment, I was just like, this feels like home. Yeah, yeah. relatable. Yes. Hashtag relatable. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I too have terrier holsters to carry around. I've got a Westie on this side and a Schnauzer on this side. Depends on what kind of rodent situation you're up against. That's right. Anyway, um, so then we have that whole thing, and they actually chase Dracula back to his home country. Right. So then we get back into sort of like this travel adventure. They're going on trains. They're traveling through Europe. They're rushing through. Poor Mina has been like kind of victimized at various points. So she's getting weaker and weaker throughout the novel. And she's also got like kind of a semi-psychic connection. She's like, to... oh, where's Dracula? I can feel him, you know? Which is kind of an interesting uh, correlation to like Laura's feelings towards um, Carmilla because mm -hmm. obviously the more Carmilla feeds on her the more she's, I don't know if the word's attracted or just like obsessed yeah. with Carmilla. Yeah. You know? Earlier you had used the word enthralled. And enthralled, I think yes. Yeah. The thrall. <laughs> the thrall of the, yeah, of the, the vampire. vampire. Yeah. yeah. So we have that, that's kind of, but, and it's, but it's so much more personal in yeah. Carmilla than it is in Dracula because obviously Mina's not with Dracula. Yeah. Their connection is kind of just like this psychic sort of, bond yeah. through through time, you know, that yeah. and she's in essence, like, I feel like her role in that moment is she's kind of just the GPS for the group. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> yeah. Whereas, like, Carmela and Laura's, you know, connection is part of what's, like, ratcheting up the, ten the tension between right. them. Yeah. Yeah. Mina becomes a piece of luggage that they yeah. carry across Europe <laughs> at a certain point. Very, very faint and pale. Yeah. And yeah. Isn't it at one point like she gets like burned by holy water or something oh, like that? Like all yeah. the things. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Just like she's getting too close to becoming a vampire. Whoa. Uh -oh. <clears throat> so obviously we've hit on several of the major themes that both of these books deal with. Both of them are trying to cope with questions of sexuality for Carmilla, homosexuality for Dracula, female desire. Dracula is much more interested in the sort of socio-political threat of the external foreigner. Right. 
Carmilla is much more interested in the internal threat of the sort of weak or self-indulgent kind of um, aristocrat who is like letting the country you know, mm-hmm. decline yeah. from within, if you will. What are some of the other things that we wanted to talk about with this? Oh, let's talk about what we think each of them does really well as a work of fiction. So apart from their thematic meanings, right. as a work of fiction, what are they successful at? What are they unsuccessful at? Well, I mean, Dracula, I think, is is pretty successful in terms of like plot structure and like getting you just completely into the story like it definitely it picks you up throws you into the plot and carries you all the way through and there's you know enough i i feel like people think that building a plot that carries you through is just about like action straight through Mm -hmm. and that actually like exhausts your reader and gets them kind of bored Mm -hmm. which is kind of not Mm counterintuitive but i think um bram stoker does succeed in doing like excellent plotting of having you rise and fall to create tension Mm -hmm. you know build tension then drop you into it you know you know so it carries you all the way through as a plot and and makes you want to keep going yeah um and that's (laughs) That's harder than people think. A lot of people are just like, oh, I'll just put like all of this action stuff in and then I'll have this backstory dump where we just talk about everything else real quick, you know, and that's like a really great way to just, I mean, I'll clock out on you real fast. (laughs) So I think one of the best things about Dracula is it's just really well paced and and, and unfolding its story and letting you as the reader unfold that story with them. You're not just, there's never a moment where when it's just like, Let's do the history of Vlad Dracula now. Yeah. <laughs> or like, yeah, we'd probably be like, in a. If it, the problem is, is that it's actually better written than a lot of modern books in this it, regard. It is, yeah. Where you know that's what Van Helsing would do. Is yeah. If the not if the, and you can always tell it's an author who is so in love with the world that they've built. Built. Yes. And the history that they've come up with, and you, yes. you guys have probably seen that like metaphor where it's like you as an author, you do all of this planning and you do all of this thinking about your character right. backstories or the context of the world and all of this world building. And that's like the stuff that's below the surface on an iceberg. And what's above the surface on an iceberg is this tiny little peak. Right. And that's just like your manuscript. That's your, what should be in your manuscript. Your reader does not want to dive with you. They no. don't want to go into the ice water with you. That's yeah. your that's your happy place, not yeah, theirs. That, and that's your homework. And it all supports the novel that sits on top Which of it. Which apparently uh, Stroker had over like a hundred pages of notes that he did on Dracula when writing a lot of the backstories and stuff that like stuff that didn't end up in that like he actually was successful he put a ton of time in building that building that world before writing it yeah so like he just I feel like was very intuitive about knowing when to drop you in information and when to just let you walk through it with the character and find out as they are finding out right exactly and then we have really great characters that we care about you care about Harker you care about Mina and you care about Lucy but for right. me like sort of victims who are closest to what's to who are experiencing the most terror yeah. I feel like yeah and but and you're also I think you know as the reader you're also you know The way that horror works is like the bad stuff has to happen. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Otherwise you don't have a story. So you kind of want, you know, another, another night and another horror. And then what happens next? You know, but Dracula has to be successful multiple times for this novel to carry through. And I think actually Van Helsing works really well as your kind of like key character who comes in and unlocks the doors. Yeah. Like he doesn't. Like, he's a very likable character. That character could become, like, pretty annoying pretty easily. And I yeah. think that he's carried very well in becoming... He almost kind of becomes, like, everybody's grandfather, yeah. you know? Like, yeah. he's your vampire grandfather. <laughs> yeah. He's a vampire hunter grandpa. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then, on the other hand, Carmilla. What does Carmilla do well, or maybe not so well? I think Carmilla does do well in, like, the creepiness feeling. Like, in this, you know, giving you the sense of a home being invaded, like... Mm-hmm. The each the unnerving. There, there's like a, a more sense of a time passage with Carmilla in the, than there is with Dracula, where mm-hmm. you're feeling like each night going to bed and wondering what's going to happen. Yeah, you know where there's like much more time gapping with Dracula. Yeah, in one sense, Carmilla is still scarier than Dracula is. I feel like in a lot of ways, Carmilla works best in a visual medium, and I was feeling that when I was reading it because my primary problem with Carmilla is um the narrator herself and i know i think what the author was trying to do was kind of express victorian women repressing even themselves right um so i know he had like an idea behind what he was doing 
But I don't think that works well in horror because like you're in this moment where you're building this terror where something's happening and you're trying to figure out what it is and you turn around and you see someone covered in blood and it's like horribly shocking and the response is, I am a very strong English woman who does not have nightmares, who does not have fancies. I'm going back to bed now. Like there's just like her constantly trying to talk herself out of what mm -hmm. she's seeing. And while you understand what he's trying to do, right. In terms of like actually writing horror, I feel like it's constantly cutting the knees out from the scene mm -hmm. where instead of like you have this moment where you want your reader to like just go over the top with you mm -hmm. instead it's just like, nope, we're going to be calm. We're going to keep it together. Yeah. And I, I don't think there's a, the, the, what he was attempting to do actually works in horror fiction, yeah. you know, or like if it, it needed to be done in a different way. And I think it probably like the repression actually needed to come from an exterior mm -hmm. rather if she's going to be the only one narrating the experience, mm -hmm. then her sense of repression probably should have come from the outside. Right. Which of course it would be very natural for that to be the role of her father. Right. Exactly. But if you, we have to exonerate the father. So he <laughs> it's, can't do it's that. fine. Yeah. He's, he, he's a good dad. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, Dracula still continues to be like extremely entertaining, but it's not very scary anymore. No, it's more of, I think of anything more of like an action adventure type mm -hmm. story. I mean, I think there's a reason that we now have like horror and gothic. Yeah. Because the gothic is a vibe, right? Yeah. Like, and it, it has all of the gothic vibes. Yeah. Um, but I don't think we would call it horror anymore just because, you know, in this is for a little desensitized. We don't mm -hmm. see these things as scary, but there's definitely moments in Dracula where if you just like let yourself, mm -hmm. you know, kind of fall, especially like when Harker's like trying to make it to the castle and like yeah. he's hearing the wolves and stuff like yeah. that, you can really, you can just let yourself fall into moments like that. Like they're always much more over the top than what yeah. you're going to see in Carmilla. But, yeah. you know, sometimes you just need the camp. <laughs> yeah. It's definitely much more campy. Yes. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, I think for Carmilla, the characterization is not as strong. And a lot of it does have to do with the fact that we're getting it from um, Laura's perspective. It's through her diary. She has to be either self-repressing or kind of ignorant for the story to move along. You right. end up with like kind of idiot main character syndrome in <laughs> yeah. order for things to happen, which is frustrating to read through. At some point you're like, I think you need to just face the facts, okay? <laughs> you're real gay. <laughs> <laughs> that and you're being eaten. <laughs> yeah. Both of those things are happening right now. Um, and, you know, and also Carmilla is like, as a character, because again, it's coming through Lila, li or... Laura's eyes, that it's like, you know, Carmela kind of falls a little flat too. I'd love for her to be a little bit more entrancing than what she is, but like, yeah. Laura's sort of like, wow, she's so nice to me. You know, <laughs> and it's because she has to be this this ignorant vessel for the information that come through. There's honestly some things that are hinted at in Carmela that like I desperately wish he had explored upon. Like there's kind of like the suggestion that she's like Carmela comes from some kind of like vampire coven. Yeah, and I'm like. I, I want that story yeah. or like there's this just scene that's like referenced about like taking place in Venice mm -hmm. at this like you know, ball. ball and there are like vampire ladies like running through and like basically victimizing people and it's just like this vague memory that someone just is like oh this happened and I'm like I want to be yeah. in the ball scene I don't want that to be a memory so there's a lot of things I feel kind of like I wish I wish you had written that story or mm -hmm. made that part of the story it just, in a lot of ways, needs to be more robust. Mm -hmm. you know, and though? it is very small. It is a very short novel. And it's kind of one of those things, like, sometimes I read a story and it's short, and I'm like, yeah, that was the real, the right decision, because mm -hmm. to try to make it more would have just, you know, bogged it down. This is the kind of story I read where I'm like, you could have made that much longer. There yeah. was so many facets where you could have been like, that's a whole scene, yeah. that's a whole scene, you know? And I, I don't know if, like, he just wasn't that type of writer. Because I know this was originally published as, like, a collection of, like, shorter yeah. stuff. So maybe he just wasn't that interested or whatever. But there were so many moments where it was like, I want There's I a want seed of stuff. And it was a broken down castle that, where they're trying to go back to where she's originally from. Right. Which itself is very psychologically interesting, too. Of, right. Like, trying to hunt There's down the so source yeah. of, of your terror, you know. It's... Anyway, it could... It, Carmela would do well with a really good movie adaptation. Yeah, well, I mean, and even, there is even a, a vampire hunter character in Carmela, but he literally shows up like at the last moment when they're like, "Oh, we figured out she's a vampire. How do we kill her?" And all of a sudden, it's like, "Hi, I'm the local vampire killer, so I'll handle that for you." And yeah. it's just like, "Okay, what, could we have maybe introduced him a little yeah. earlier?" Like, yeah, <laughs> my grandfather killed her first round, so yeah. I'll kill this round. You know, it's yeah, it's like. Where did you even come from? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's also like, 
do, I do think it's really interesting too that like we have we have well and I guess it's like it makes a lot of sense because the victims have to be pitiable they have to be weak they have to be small so it's like all of these young women whether we have a female vampire or a male vampire right. are like the victims of the main vampire in this story um so there's always like this sort of like paranoia of what's happening to our young girls right you know right. and and that it's bound up with sexuality I just think is so interesting we're not worried about the young boys and their sexuality they, they can, can go they can figure that out on their own yeah they can go hang out with vampires all they want but the young the young ladies are like this protected resource you know right well because I feel like there's kind of like an attitude of like okay if the guys need to fool around like they can do that they can still come back and have you know their wives and their families and whatever mm -hmm. but like the women we have to, that, that has to be kept safe. Like yeah. that's what, that's an endangered resource that we need to protect. Right. Which then, that reminds me, it does tie in with this, the way in which like in our patriarchal society, like the transaction of marriage is arbitrated by male power. Right. And that is sort of like at the core of what's going on with Carmilla is that we have this romantic sexual relationship that is completely outside of the hospices of that transaction right. that men would normally govern or be right. in charge of. And it, that boy, if that isn't terrifying to a patriarchal hierarchy. Yeah. Like the women can just get along without us. Yeah. I mean, that's uh -oh. kind of an interesting thing I was reading recently about, um, like how in essence, like societies take control of women mm -hmm. and, and how like in medieval periods, like women and men were separated in like community groups. Um, but that actually led to a lot of positives because a lot of women would like get together and in essence like start businesses for themselves and have ways to support themselves and like connecting with other women actually empowered them mm -hmm. and basically when we got through reformation that stopped and we separated people into individual families and a mm -hmm. lot of community you know gatherings mm -hmm. and that actually like de-emphasized women's powers mm -hmm. taking them away from each other yeah yeah and so there is kind of like this you know underlying concern of like oh if we let these two women be together will something bad happen mm -hmm. you know which brings up an interesting point which is like is that the sort of underlying fear of the typical kind of witch fear or the witch novel or even like witch hunting right which would be the only other kind of scary creature that also is very connected to their humanity yes yeah. understands their memories and is connected to their self-identity yeah but is in inherently damned and right. yeah, is still connected to that concept of like i made the, this choice that will yeah. ultimately damn me yeah. yeah interesting very interesting so they seem to be very, as we are unsurprised here with the Victorians, socializing novels that right. even at the same time that they're almost unconsciously playing out these fears that they have are also very strictly putting forth the right way to behave. Yes. I mean, uh, Dracula is removed from the, England is saved yes. from Wallachia. Yeah. <laughs> They're not gonna. In, they're not gonna invade anytime soon. Yeah, and and also, okay, which brings up another thing is like just this sort of like kind of curiosity and thrall that like the British, but many people, the West, you might say more more broadly, has with the East and mm -hmm. with like Transylvania being this sort of like intersection spot between the East and the West, and. and um, you know, that's how England feels as a culture about these maybe other cultures that feel very different or foreign. You're both right. attracted and repulsed and it's different. And it's, it's like other. a fascination with it, but then also a fear of it. Yeah. I mean, because like English culture, especially uh, Victorian England culture, it like venerates itself, mm -hmm. like seriously venerates itself. You know, yeah. uh, there's like often the joke about like, you know, English people being in other countries and referring to the people who are from those countries as the foreigners. Yeah. And it's like, I think that I would have be, a little perspective. That might be you <laughs> yeah. actually, you know, so like English culture superior in all yeah. ways. And you know, that's, that's a huge structure, especially from this time era. So yeah, like it's, I feel like it's really interesting that like, we're not just encountering another culture and being like, that's weird. We're encountering another culture and being like, that's scary. Yeah. That is a different, but and it's also very kind scary. of interesting and alluring. It's and I'm kind like, of want to be there, but then I'm kind of afraid. And, kind of, <laughs> and maybe, it, maybe the other culture but will bite me on the neck. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> well, it's like, but like, it's like that concept, like of sin of like sin is alluring, you yeah. know, but your consequences are death, you know? Yeah. So that, that alluring is going to lead you to death. Yeah. This sort of like classic Protestant framework here. Yeah. 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 It's, fabulous novel though I yeah. can't, you can't deny that no. <laughs> so do you have any recommendations for other vampire books that I are so many <laughs> you know good 
I, I not realize because I, I like I, I read like six or eight books at the time. It's not a good habit, but I do. And I realized this morning as I was thinking that I'm like reading three different vampire novels as we're going right now. So um, a couple of ones. For someone who just wants like something really light and campy and fun, um, John Eyre actually is like a really fun read. It's a uh, remix of Jane Eyre and Dracula. Um, so it's by Mimi Matthews. And it's gender swap. And it's gender swap. So yeah, Dracula is, you know, or Bertha is the, um, Bertha Rochester is like the main character instead of Mr. Rochester. Um, and then we have John Eyre instead of Jane Eyre. Mm -hmm. um, that one's a pretty light, like just fun gothic read. Um, I also really like the Immortal Soul series, uh, which is like a uh, Dracula sequel. That is not light. That is true horror. So I don't recommend that for people who are slightly squeamish. Um, but I really, really love that one. It's by Catherine Ryan Kingsland. Um, but I also think it, those are two like modern stories that directly relate to Dracula. Um, but they are written in modern, modern times. If you want something that actually like feels like it was written as like a true successor, then I would say that's Anne Rice's Interviews with the Vampire. Yeah. That still has so much of the feel of the way that Dracula is written, um, while also just being like very original. Like it's mm -hmm. not, there's no, we're not calling back. To, like these guys are, we're, we have vampires from like France and America. Yeah. You know, we're not, we're not going to Eastern Europe like everyone does. Like, okay, we yeah. just got to default back to vampires are from Eastern Europe. Like this yeah. is a completely different take, but it has that like really, fun, adventure campiness, while also being pretty dark. So yeah. I think, yeah, depending on what you're, like, looking at, if you want something just, like, kind of nice and fun, mm -hmm. John Eyre, Mimi Matthews. If you want, like, Dracula, like, sequel and mm -hmm. what happens after, but also, like, just straight-up horror, um, Immortal Soul series. And then, yeah, if you just want to experience Dracula, but, like, have something completely new, interviews with the vampire. Fantastic. I really like vampire fiction. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny because I actually did read Twilight like during the height of Twilight. And it and there were a bunch of other like vampire stuff that came out right. pretty soon after that for a YA audience. And I think one of the things that like those the novels that came out kind of in that time and of that era get wrong is that they do not incorporate the horror. There's yeah. no real sense of fear. There's no real sense of like kind Edward. Of Edward should be repulsive on some level. level. Yeah. Um, not just attractive. That's part of, as Nathaniel Hawthorne would say, the lurid intermixture. <laughs> that's, like, like his, that's his catchphrase on like what makes horror horrifying is that right. you're kind of attracted to it yeah and you're kind of and that makes you question yourself as exactly. a person and and we you know the whole point is that we externalize these internal impulses that we have and we put them in a monster so that we can examine them right but the point is is that they are a part of us and so we should be sort of we are a little bit alarmed by the types of desires that we can have right. and how out of control they can feel. I can't help whom I'm attracted to. And so it feels like it's a little bit outside of my control that there's this animal passion that exists within me that the rational mind cannot fully suppress. And like, is like, that's inherently like the deepest human fear is being out of control. Right. Like I can't control my impulses, my attractions, my desires, you know, mm -hmm. that's terrifying. Yeah. And so that part is like, like, they are out of control in terms of their desires. So it's like the perfect yeah. example of like your walking fears and right. having to look at it. And yet modern vampire fiction that takes place in, in modern times, I've tried to read a couple. I have not read Twilight. I was told not to. And the reason it's why, right. and, and I was just like, yeah, I think that's not me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I, I have yet to find a vampire story set in modern times. Mm -hmm. And I think it's in part like, we well, can see, like we people feel more comfortable putting just mm -hmm. horror or sexuality on the page, mm -hmm. and so that because like There's putting no it on implication, right? Putting it just straight on the page and just being like there, it, like you lose so much. in essence, like kind of losing the like the opportunity to think through what this is talking about mm -hmm. and what you're afraid of and what the. Yeah. I mean, we were talking about like with in some of the. Um, film versions of Dracula, mm -hmm. things that happen off the page in the book happen, you know, on screen in the film. Right. And it's actually less scary mm -hmm. because you're just like seeing things happen versus like someone walking into a room, there's a dead person. And is the scary thing still in the room? I don't know. And is this person really dead? So it's mm -hmm. like much more fear inducing. And I think a lot of modern stuff is just like, Hey, look, we can show it. So we will. And then you're mm -hmm. just like, 
Uh, I'm bored. Yeah, and so much of the of the of the exploration of the fear is the exploration of the unknown. So right. whether you're going into the deep dark woods, I don't know what's out there, which it, or if you're going into the you know inner psychological landscape of the deep dark woods, I don't really know what's inside of me. That that exploration, which is why Dracula works so well as travel in this mm-hmm. travel genre, yeah. because that's what travel genre does too, is like it. part of horror is the exploration. Right. But if you're working within this sort of like highly materialistic, highly, you know, known world of the modern era, and you're not sort of either transporting us to a Gothic house or transporting us to a Transylvanian woods or transporting us to a ramshackle castle yeah. or transporting us to and of course the gothic south it works so well like yeah. you know a, a, a ramshackle you know plantation. plantation yeah those settings work not because we're we're exploring the unknown within those buildings but we're exploring the unknown within ourselves within our own psychological landscape that's right. the point and so if it's in you know new york city on the streets of new york city or you know where was it somewhere in Oregon or what, or whatever oh, yeah, for, yeah. for Twilight, just a normal town where you can't explore the psychological landscape of the unknown, then it's not going to work as horror. Right, right. Horror has to trigger something in you to work. And, and when you're not triggered, because like that just looks like, you know, going to high school right? and like, whatever, I did that, yeah. <laughs> you know, like there's nothing triggering about that. And I <clears throat> sorry, I don't think that she was trying, Stephanie Meyer was trying for horror either, Yeah, which no. is, is kind of a strange thing to like take these, this is a monstrous creature, right? Like mm-hmm. this is someone who requires killing someone to survive, Yeah, you know, and is also like, you know, perpetually in existence, which is, should be terrifying, Yeah, you know, to be like, that's not scary. Yeah. is kind of like weirdly undercutting humanity in a way. Mm -hmm. Like you're not acknowledging what humans are actually afraid of. Yeah. And it, and she does anesthetize it, you know, throughout for various like choices that she makes throughout the book, which like they eat animal blood instead of human blood and that's how they survive or whatever. And so they're like, you know, and so it's like, well, you're taking the teeth out of, the effectiveness of what this genre actually has to offer you're like you're undercutting your own like potential in your story and i would argue in in a way making their characters seem less human yeah because like they don't feel like they have the same like inherent fears that Mm -hmm. normal humans do right right and and the other thing that happens a lot and this is something that i kind of i've analyzed in other areas because i ended up i don't know if you guys remember like the um, Pride and Prejudice in Zombies and the right, Sense yes. and Sensibility in Sea Monsters. Well, there's another book called Emma and Vampires that came out like at that same time of like monsterifying classic literature or whatever. And one of the things that you do, and you can see it even in like TV shows, like what was that TV show about the vampires also? <laughs> Which that, that it's like a teenager one that was on the CW right around Twilight. Was this in, uh, Vampire Diaries? Vampire or? Diaries, okay. Yes, where... When you are trying to incorporate the um, vampire as a viable romantic interest, Mm -hmm. who is then then you have to make them socially acceptable as a romantic interest, which means that you have you have to make moves like oh they don't drink human blood they drink animal blood. Then you still have to push out the evil to the other outside of that wherever you draw that line. So you're not really realizing the problem that you're incorporating. Like you're not recognizing that you still have to have an enemy, you still have to have an evil outside of yourself, you still have to, and you still have to cast something as that evil. And there's something about our relativistic society that wants to both be self-righteous, because we're fundamentally like this hardcore Protestant, you know, nation here in America, with our roots back to the Puritans are so strong in our culture. We want to have these clear lines of right and wrong, but we're really struggling with our sort of moral relativism and maybe being more open-minded in the way that our ethics are changing, but you're still like pushing the evil other further and further away without really encountering what ethics even means at a fundamental level so that you can have an effective story. It's because people are ignorant about their own worldview. Yeah. <laughs> and then they go and write a crappy book that they haven't even thought about. Well, it makes me really mad. There's also like, self-examination is such a human thing in yeah. and of itself. Right. Like, like humans who are worth being humans, like are willing to be like, I need to think about why I feel this way. Yeah. And that's 
I feel like that's how we get vampires through self-examination. Yes. So when you write a vampire story without any self-examination, it's just like so what you're weird. doing doesn't make sense. <laughs> it's just like and it's what's really, going on. It's really this discomfort. This is the thing that I would say about like what I think the sort of Stephanie Meyer vampire story tells us is that we are very, very uncomfortable with naming that which is evil evil. Yeah, I mean, because she even talked about like the whole concept behind her story was like oh having the forbidden mm -hmm. but then it's like it well combined... how can he be forbidden it, like there is no forbidden quality to him yeah exactly it's like he's like, completely they're, they're... endorsable yeah he's, like he he makes his own music and he's really attractive and he's very kind to her and he protects her and he yeah, doesn't like, even drink what... human blood like what about him is forbidden, forbidden. right exactly yeah. it's just like oh it it almost makes vampire being a vampire just like oh you're from a different country you know yeah, exactly <laughs> like, yeah, yeah it makes it very um it, well, it takes the teeth out of it. The vampire teeth. teeth. <laughs> the yeah. fangs out of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, if anyone wants to recommend yeah. a vampire takes place in, mod in modern times and works novel, by all means, well, I have not found it yet. You have to be willing to encounter the evil and what yeah. that means to you. And it's, and it's so interesting in this world where we're so self-righteous and, you know, we want to put, you know, the next Instagram post about, you know, whatever tragedy is going on in the world and you didn't post about it. And oh my God, we have a very sort of self-righteous culture that at the same time is so uncomfortable with calling that which is evil, evil. It's almost a little Victorian being yeah. like, hey, did you see what Belgium did? I, don't look at England. Just yeah. look at Belgium. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, anyway, and I think it would be, um, I think it would actually be a really successful novel. Emily, you should write it. I'm right. commissioning you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, you're welcome. Not that you don't have like 50 other of your own novel ideas to write. I think it would be, but I do think it would be very helpful for our culture. It would be cathartic for our culture to have a novel that helped us to articulate what we mean when we talk about evil. Yes. Even in the midst of a society that's ready to condemn, you know, whomever when right. they mess up. Well, and I think that it would be, it would be helpful for a lot of our own society to self-examine because we have so much external to yeah. go after. Yeah. So much external yeah. that I think that we kind of become addicted to that. Yeah. And then the more addicted to that, the more we just like, oh, I feel weird, but it must be because it's the external problem. Right. You know, we can blame anything on it because there are so many external problems. Yeah. It's very easy to be like, I have anxiety because of external problems. Mm -hmm. You know, like I feel weird about myself because of external problems. And so, yeah, like I feel like we would be rife for the self-examination that vampires yeah. give us yeah so writers of the world <laughs> yeah it's time also for just it. stop calling him dracula maybe give a different name like so yeah. one other vampire other than dracula yeah there's so another dracula it. movie coming out this summer and as much as i have re like bought re dracula stuff and everything i have even got to the point where it's like maybe he could have a different name occasionally yeah. like maybe he could not be from Romania this time yeah you know? or or a civil war soldier that are, those are the two choices that's, that's the only options we got <laughs> yeah. all right well those are well, some... you, did you have any recommendations oh yes recommendations so i like to go the comedic route because for me dracula even though i understand it's operating within the horror genre is hilarious to me <laughs> in case you couldn't tell from my reenactments of the story I just think it's absolutely funny. So I really enjoy What We Do in the Shadows, which is a movie, uh, sort of a mockumentary. You guys probably know it. And there's also a TV spinoff show, that both of which I enjoy, because I do think there is a, a truly wonderful comedic element to the vampire genre. I mean, part of horror being horrifying, like good horror, not just like, you know, gross horror, like that's just, you know, mm -hmm. us inherently being grossed out by some things, but like true horror that's not really about that, but being fear, a lot of times you have to like kind of set aside a part of yourself. To, in order to be afraid of this, I have to set apart the side of myself that's like, wait, what? That's silly. <laughs> that's not true. That's yeah. not how the world works. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I feel like it is a very easy place to be like, okay, but if you actually thought about this, it's yes. quite funny. <laughs> yeah, it is. And and that's why, you know, like, that's why movies like Young Frankenstein Design. also yes. exist. It's yes. just, you know, the flip side of the tragic comic, you know, yeah. masks. The flip side of that mask is right. the comedic mask, and it works so well. It's just there, so close yeah. for anyone who's, like, willing to be like, oh, but... This have is you, ridiculous. Have you thought that through? Have yeah. you thought that all, what would happen at the end if that was actually true? Yeah. So those are my recommendations. Is there anything else that we need to cover before we say adieu? I think we have gotten deep into spooky season. Yeah. So 
yeah, if you're looking for a good book to read for spooky season, like, I feel like this is just like, I don't know, this is how I like start fall for me yeah. and go find myself a scary book. Mm -hmm. It's like still a hundred degrees outside, but I'm like, I want fall to be. The amount of TikToks that I have bookmarked and like favorited because they're just like lists of weird fiction. I've gotten into weird fiction. It's your fault, actually. Um, and so now, <laughs> I'm not sad. Uh, yeah, I'm proud of myself, actually. <laughs> like, just like, like weird horror, plant horror. <laughs> I mean, it's such that that inherently is English in and of itself. Yeah. Like, like I was listening to a group of in like a, English comic artists talking about like what they do their comics on, and one girl's yeah. like. Well, I have this existential fear that my plants are going to come to life one day and kill me. And I'm like, yep, you're English. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In our environment, this is not a fear that we have. No, we're killing them. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. But also, it's sort of like, it's too arid of a climate. Like, like we don't get that kind of rainfall for, like, plants to be a threat. Okay. <laughs> yeah. We're trying to keep them alive. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Barely struggling through. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah, we got to wrap this up. Enjoy some spooky season. Yes. And thank you so much for joining us today. Our podcast is available anywhere that you listen. Spotify, Apple, Google. Um, also on YouTube, at a lovely jaunt. And so you can see us all there. And until next time, my name is Alexandra. I'm Emily. And I hope you have a lovely spooky season. Bye. <laughs>